I am the curator of the University Herbarium here in Cambridge. And when I was an undergraduate here, a bit over 20 years ago, the herbarium was really not being used very much in research and teaching even then. Um, and this, this was the case when I started um, in post here as the curator. So I've really been working over the last few years to try to get the collection much more accessible and available for researchers and members of the public to actually engage with it and see what we've got and, and also so that we can learn what the specimens actually are that we have here and tell some of their stories. I'm going to give you a little overview of um, the history of this herbarium. Um, it really is very poorly known actually nowadays um, and Edwin's work is really key in starting to unlock and, and explain and interpret um, and discover the herbarium specimens in our earliest collections and um, those of the 18th century. So, but just to give you a bit of a scene setting, um, the University Herbarium was founded in the mid 1700s with the donation of a Hortus Siccus, um, literally a dried pressed garden uh, by the second professor of botany in Cambridge, John Martin. The first picture you saw was a picture of the Great House, um, which is in Free School Lane in the centre of Cambridge. It was around where um, the Department of HPS, History and Philosophy of Science, is based now. And that was leased in uh, 1760 and it was used for botany lectures and, and there was a room dedicated for the storage of books and the Hortus Siccus. So that was John Martin's herbarium collection. So a new building was built in the um, what was the, the old botanic garden, which was a physic garden in the centre of Cambridge. Um, that was built um, in the 1780s and that had rooms dedicated to botany as well. And this is where Thomas Martin, John Martin's son, who succeeded his father to become a third professor of botany here, would have given his lectures and the herbarium would have been housed as well. Between the two of them, the Martins were in the chair of botany for some 90 years. And it's, it's Thomas Martin that, that Edwin is particularly working on. So in 1825, John Stevens Henslow became the uh, the next professor of botany in Cambridge, the fourth professor of botany. And it, he was really instrumental in making the Botanic Garden and the University Herbarium research and, collect, and teaching collections um, much more active, much more used in, in, in the modern sort of scientific way. Um, jo John Stephen Tenslow, um, he restored and repaired what he could of, of what was left of the Martins herbarium. And that is pretty much what we have in that collection today. So we're gonna show you some specimens of the collection. Those are the specimens that, that um, Henslow um, rescued basically. Henslow added enormously to the collection and really made uh, botany teaching um, really significant in Cambridge. So the, in the mid 1800s, the Botanic Garden moved to the south of the city um, and the uh, Salvin building and was built on what is now the new museum site. The really big move for the herbarium was in 1904 when botany moved across the road to what you can see in this picture, which for those of you who, who know Cambridge is on down in site. And that is the botany school that is now known as the Department of Plant Sciences. But there's a large room in there which is dedicated to the University Herbarium. And the next few slides have got some lovely pictures of the old uh, herbarium which was in the botany school. When I was a student, this is where the herbarium was based. And we had these wooden cabinets um, and parquet flooring um, stuffed full of extraordinary specimens. So that was a really, really big move. Um, the herbarium. What's nice in these pictures is you can you can see the um, the cupboards with the specimens laid out systematically within them. So this is the Sainsbury Laboratory, which is on the Botanic Garden site, but it is a separate research institute of the university. Um, and this is where the herbarium is based now, and this is me um, in the collection. Um, and the herbarium is all moved into roller racking, into compactors. Um, and you can see we've got the specimens laid out um, in this collection here now. We've got some workrooms, we've got some facilities for visitors, um, but it's um, it's still not a very accessible space. So through doing tours, through doing events and activities, we really, really hope that uh, we can start to open up the collection and start getting our specimens online as well. So that's I've talked far too long. Um, really, the meat of the, the session is we want 
Edwin to tell you much more about the 18th century collection. So um, it's my very great pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Edwin Rose. He's currently the Munby Fellow in Bibliography at the uh, Cambridge University Library, and he's a research fellow at Darwin College. And I'd just like to say how enjoyable it's been working with Edwin over uh, the last year or so um, as he starts to explore and unlock this collection. So over to you, Edwin. Well, thank you very much for um, such a lovely introduction, Lauren, to the history of the herbarium. And yes, as you say, I'm now going to give a bit of an overview and give some examples of where specimens came from um, in relation to the third professor of botany, Thomas Martin, and his, really his time as professor between 7, 1762 and 1825. I should just add that this research has been curtailed somewhat by COVID. I mean, I've been able to do an amazing in-depth coverage of materials held in Cambridge as I've had access to, but certain things like the letters that Martin wrote to his colleagues now held in places like the British Library have been inaccessible for the majority of the time I have now been in post. So in July 1760, Dr Richard Walker, the Vice Master of Trinity College, transferred £1,600 to the University of Cambridge for, the, for the purpose of establishing, to quote, a public botanic or physic garden. This purchased the old Augustinian Priory, a piece of land now known as the new museum site that was converted into the first Cambridge Botanic Garden. So today I'm going to concentrate on the approaches used by Professor Thomas Martin, the third professor of botany in 1763 until his death in 1825, and a succession of curators, whose chronological dates you can see on the chart here, to collect, classify, catalogue, and cultivate plants from across the globe in the original Cambridge Botanic Garden. And aspects of this activity really survive in the Cambridge University Herbarium, and in the large library that Martin assembled, now mostly held in Cambridge University Library. This period has actually amazingly been ridiculed by historians and botanists alike. Writing in the 1830s, John Lindley, for example, described Thomas Martin as, to quote, the gentleman who filled the same chair for so many years without performing any other duty than that of collecting his pay. More recently, the historian John Gascoigne has described natural history in Cambridge as being, um, to quote, at the periphery of Cambridge intellectual life, adding that it left no lasting impression on the university, close quote. This is really quite extraordinary because this is in spite of the formal integration of botany into the institutional framework and obviously the massive investment that came with the foundation of the Botanic Garden. As you can see on the slide here, Curators employed during Martin's tenure, who were mainly responsible for the practical and systematic management of this garden, were, um, include Charles Miller, Thomas Martin himself, John Salton, James Don, and Arthur Biggs, who remained in post until 1845. Martin consolidated his management of the garden after Richard Walker's death in 1764. And unlike other botanic or physic gardens of the period, which were founded or adapted to facilitate the activities of a growing medical school or society of physicians and apothecaries, the Cambridge Botanic Garden remained small and had very little, in fact, to do with, with the medical school. Rather, as Martin stated in an outline to his lectures, the Cambridge Garden was developed in according to his interests um, in exploring, describing and inventory a global variety of species. So to quote from Martin's original lectures, the great enlargement of the British dominions in America has opened the field for new discoveries and improvements in natural history. And the extensiveness, I might also say, the universality of our trade gives into our hands natural treasures of every climate. This placed an emphasis on studying the extent of God's creation an understanding of which was seen to improve Britain on a national scale and also in, uh, facilitate imperial dominion. To achieve this aim, Martin and his curators de developed a comprehensive botanical library 
and global network to gather specimens for their botanical museum. So during the 1760s, a main task of Martin and Charles Miller, the first curator, was to design and plant the new garden. This was described by Martin in the official minutes for the garden in 1768, in which he stipulated that, to quote, the, the garden should be ordered according to the system of Linnaeus, close quote. Martin and Miller's naming and division of the living plants into Linnaean classes, orders, genera and species is reflected in their arrangement and was outlined in a plan that Martin published in 1771. And this, the Linnaean system is really the first kind of modern um, attempt to systematically classify nature. Plants were divided into groups according to the Linnaean hierarchy of classes, orders, genera and species, although some species, such as those that required warmer conditions, were kept in the south facing greenhouses and the larger trees and shrubs surrounded the Linnaean beds. And this really copies the specifications that Linnaeus himself, a Swedish botanist, laid out in Philosophia Botanica and Hortus of Saliensis, two books um, he published, or both written in Latin. As you can see here, this is the design of the garden that Linnaeus um, designed in Uppsala, which in Sweden. The um, prints that you can actually see here are, are really quite incredible. I've, I actually came across them in, in the university library um, a, a couple of weeks ago, and they actually come from the collection of Edward Daniel Clark, a contemporary of Martin's and professor of mineralogy at Cambridge, who, as you can see, according to his notes in the front here, collected them as he traveled across Scandinavia, Russia, and the Near East between 1799 and 1803. The Linnaean arrangement of the Cambridge Botanic Garden at the time of its foundation makes it the first institution of its kind to be founded according to the core principles of Linnaeus, or, um, or of the Linnaean system in Britain. Although these, um, there were earlier botanic gardens, most notably the Chelsea Physic Garden in London and the botanic gardens kept by Oxford and Edinburgh universities, these were arranged according to the relations of various plants to medicine or earlier systems of classification. Writing to his fellow botanist, Richard Pulteney, um, in 1760, Martin suggested to quote, I wish to Mr. Solander would make a visit here that I might have the pleasure of conversing with a pupil of Linnaeus. This was Daniel Solander, who had been employed by the British Museum to reorganize the old natural history collection according to the Linnaean system. And it seems that he did visit Cambridge to advise on the establishment of the new garden. Attempts to emulate the designs of the Uppsala Garden in Cambridge become evident from examining the general arrangement of the plants and buildings. For example, the greenhouses are situated at the far end of the garden. In the Cambridge Garden, the greenhouses were placed alongside the back wall of the old mansion house, which was later Mortlock, Mortlock's and then Barclays Bank, and is now the locality of Zizi's Pizza. You can see the greenhouses on the slide here. As can be seen in this view of the garden taken in 1815. The curator's house that Lauren also mentioned, which was the former refectory of the old Augustinian Priory, was located to the left of this image, just down here somewhere, in fact, perhaps even its chimney just there. Um, and this was then converted uh, into the botanical lecture room and museum. In the original statutes for the garden, to quote, a large unfinished room above the stairs be made a library for books in botany and other sciences relating thereto, and a part thereof for the Hortus Siccus. By 1783, the mansion house, which was really the ruins of the old Augustinian priory, was deemed to be inadequate and leased to the banker John Mortlock for £150, a sum that allowed for the completion of the greenhouses and stove house, facilitating the cultivation of a more diverse variety of species from Central America, South Africa, India, and the Pacific. To replace the lost teaching space, the university commissioned a new building that was constructed on the southeast corner of the site, incorporating a botanical lecture theater, library, and museum, which I like to think of as the first new, new museum 
of the new museum site. Charles Miller, the son of the famous botanist Philip Miller of the Chelsea Physic Garden, was the first curator of the Cambridge Botanic Garden. Miller was an advocate of the Linnaean system and supported Martin's scheme to design the garden according to Linnaean principles. Miller kept an interleaved copy of the botanical sections of Systema Naturae, the most recent Linnaean account at the time of the garden's foundation. However, rather than adding descriptions of new species as had been the practicals of individuals like Linnaeus to his own copies of this book, Miller's annotations revise specific taxonomic descriptions and, and the placement of different species within the different classes and genera. These descriptions are very morphological. They describe things like the shape of the internal parts of the flowers, the leaves and the stalk, for example. These were primarily based on his observations of the living plants in the Cambridge Botanic Garden. Miller's philosophical observations of the living plants were combined with their practical management. A book central to these practices was his copy of Philip Miller's Gardener's Dictionary, a book that gave an outline and description for numerous horticultural practices and approaches to keeping different species in British gardens. However, Charles Miller's copy continued to use early pre-Linnaean polynomial names for species. These could often be 10, 10 words long, whereas the Linnaean binomial is a two-part name listing the genus and the species. As a result, Miller added Linnaean binomials to the margins, as we can see here, revising the name of every species mentioned in the printed text. These names were extracted from the 1762 to three edition of Linnaeus's Species Plantarum and reflect the names used on the labels attached to the plants in the garden. Miller's annotations allowed him to cross-reference living species in the Cambridge Botanic Garden with the descriptions in the gardener's dictionary a connection that he reinforced by the presence of botanical specimens that he placed next to the related text, providing binomial reference points that link the practical approach to managing the garden with the philosophical system of Linnaeus and the actual physical plants. So the botanic garden remained so impoverished that it could not build up a library. Rather, it had to rely on donations from naturalists, including John Wilmer, the founder Richard Walker, fellows of various Cambridge colleges, and Martin's father, John Martin, who presented his collection in 1763. John Martin's was by far the largest of these donations. In addition to a library, it included a large collection of plant specimens, and the various provenances of these shed light on John, John Martin's transnational European and global networks, extending across Britain, Asia, and the Americas. For example, in 1733, John Martin received a large consignment of specimens and books from William Houston, a surgeon employed by the trustees of the province of Georgia in America to collect specimens in the West Indies and Central America. Writing to Hans Sloan, the great physician who founded the British Museum, shortly after being shipwrecked in Vera Cruz on the 5th of March 1731, Houston described how, to quote, I have sent up an Indian, a word for an indigenous person, who has brought me down four small roots of it, which I hope will grow, and I believe we shall find it a plant quite different to the marvel of Peru. This is in relation to a plant that he was very interested in for its medical properties. John Martin's collection contains dozens of specimens from Veracruz. An example I have on the slide here that we also hope to show you later. And it seems probable that they were collected by indigenous people Houston employed. Houston was not allowed to leave the port and go into the countryside because of the restrictions imposed by the Spanish authorities. And it's currently one of my research interests to explore the different aims and motivations of figures such as Martin, Houston and the indigenous person who collected the specimen for participating in this and similar networks. By the 1760s, so going forward 30 years, Thomas Martin modelled his network on a similar structure, actively seeking to establish the Cambridge Botanic Garden as a major institutional seat capable of receiving and cultivating species from across the globe. Charles Miller left Cambridge in 1770 for a position as an East India Company gardener in Fort Marlborough, Sumatra. 
In a letter sent to the botanist Richard Pulteney, Martin described Miller's departure and his role in Sumatra. To quote, our garden has lost its curator, Mr. Charles Miller. He has gone to the East Indies to execute a favourite scheme of Mr. Sullivan's, the finding and cultivating of nutmegs or any of the spices or indeed any other vegetable productions which may make advantageous objects of commerce. A young man of Mr. Miller's improved understanding will probably make some important discoveries in natural history. Thus, I could not but rejoice on his account as well as on the creditable manner in which my friend let, left England. Yet it left a considerable burden upon me. Miller's departure did, however, give Martin another correspondent in a distant part of the world. Miller sent many long letters describing specimens and seeds he sent Martin uh, to grow in Cambridge. These were collected during considerable periods in which Miller lived with the uh, Batak people while on expeditions traveling across northern Sumatra. Writing in response to a series of questions from Martin sent on the natural history of Sumatra, Miller described how to quote, I have made inquiry among the most learned of the Malays and also among those of several different nations on this island, that being Sumatra, concerning Mount Opia and the almond trees. Miller consistently placed a heavy emphasis on the value of information supplied by local informants describing how to quote, I have taken five journeys into different parts of the interior country. I have been hitherto so fortunate as to meet with no obstructions from the country people, but on the contrary, have been well received and treated with hospitality everywhere, close quote. The Batak actively assisted with Miller's botanical collecting, and he formulated Linnaean names, recorded phonetic transcriptions and indigenous, of indigenous terms and the uses for species, as can be seen on this slide here on some of the labels attached to some of the specimens that he um, sent to Martin. This presented a direct line of communication between Cambridge and remote parts of the world, initiating the transfer of information between Martin, Miller and Batak societies in Sumatra. Martin's network also extended through his connections with travellers who returned to Britain. Writing to Pulteney in 1772, Martin described how to quote, last week I had the pleasure of spending a morning with Mr. Banks and Dr. Solander. You will easily imagine how delighted I was to turn over the 3000 specimens of plants, 1000 of them new species and colored drawings of 700, all elegantly and accurately done upon the spot as were also very full descriptions. These gentlemen expect in less than a month to set out for the Southern world with three ships, most royally equipped, and four draftsmen, one for views and figures, the celebrated Zafani, and three for natural history. This is a direct reference to Martin's observation of the materials collected by Joseph Banks and Daniel Solander during James Cook's first voyage to the South Pacific, during which Cook charted large portions of New Zealand and New Holland, and now a continent that we now know as Australia. Central to Banks's, Solander's and their team of natural history staff's approach to recording and classifying information were their interleaved copies of Linnaeus's books, very similar to what Charles Miller was using in, um, in the old botanic garden. And into these, they actually inserted descriptions of the new species that they encountered as the endeavour circumnavigated the globe. These all contained refined descriptions that utilised information sourced from indigenous people in the regions they visited, some of which was corrected by figures such as Mai, who you can see in the portrait here, a Polynesian who visited London in 1774. Martin received duplicates of some of these specimens, one of which I will discuss in the brief show and tell at the end of this talk. So Martin, sorry, Martin emulated Banks and Solander's approach to annotating and interleaving printed books to facilitate the addition of new information alongside a growing collection in his Catalogus Hortae Botanicae Canterburgiensis. This book was produced by the printer for Cambridge University Press, John Archdeacon, and not published for general, um, general circulation. It is actually incredibly rare now. Martin described how his catalogue, like his other works on the flora of Cambridgeshire, is, to quote, intended wholly for the use of my pupils, 
close quote. And to this day, Cambridge remains by far the, mo the main repository for this very scarce botanical book. Martin had one copy of his catalogus interleaved with blank pages specifically designed to accommodate the addition of binomial names and descriptions of new species added to the Cambridge Botanical Garden. A result of the com completion of the greenhouses in 1772 and the extension of the stove house, which was like a sort of hot house with a fire in it to keep the plants warm, um, in 1775, Martin was now able to add a significant number of new exotic species to the collection. Martin's annotated descriptions relate to the tropical species kept in the greenhouses and those in the printed text, which was obviously represent the earlier stage of the botanic garden before the extensions were made to the hot houses. Um, are obviously um, hardy species. So for example, Martin on the page that you can see here has annotated the name and description for the species of Protea conifera, a species endemic to the Western Cape in South Africa, adding that a living example was kept among the, the, the larger shrubs in the greenhouse as evidenced from the code GHS that you can see here, standing for greenhouse shrub. This species was also represented in Martin's herbarium, although the specimen was re remounted in the 19th century and Martin's original label has been lost. These tended to refer to the garden itself and its date of collection. This systematic approach and nomenclature linked the herbarium, books and the living plants for the rest of the old garden's existence. In 1778, Martin was replaced as curator, although not professor, by John Sultan who continued to use this book for the management of the garden. Sultan's hand appears alongside Martin's, as you can see here, and he seems to have kept using Martin's systematic approach and codes, marking this species that originated in Peru with HA to stand for hardy annual. Sultan often added extra information on species, such as the time it flowered or perceived medical and economic uses. In his description of Morris pathifera, Sultan added that its common name was the paper mulberry, and it originated from Japan and the South Seas Isles, that being um, the Society Islands, places like Tahiti in the South Pacific. This species became particularly important to travelers in the Pacific. The bark was commonly beaten to produce bark cloth or tapa, and the first examples were really initially brought back to Britain by Joseph Banks, who we heard about earlier, and Johann Reinhold Forster after James Cook's first and second voyages. And the example on the slide here is um, an example from the Cook collection in now held by the Archaeology and Anthropology Museum in Cambridge. So in comparison to other species, Sultan added the abbreviation HS next to the description of, of the um, Morris or paper mulberry. This stood for Hortus siccus, roughly translated to, to the dry garden or herbarium of preserved specimens. By 1783, these were preserved in the new museum and curated by Martin and Sultan. Martin often gave tours of the collection as evidenced by a university notice that he issued in 1781, in which he stated that to quote, Mr. Martin usually spends the morning in the museum and will be ready to give any previous information to those who design to attend his lectures, as well as to exhibit the specimens of natural history which he has collected in Switzerland and Italy, both to his pupils and to such as have not the leisure to go through his course. These specimens were collected on one of Martin's grand tours across Europe, which he took between 1778 and 1780 traveling with his family and a student. Martin received many specimens from fellow botanists he cons conversed with as he traveled across the continent and visited various institutional botanic gardens. Others, such as that shown on the slide here, which he collected near the Swiss Valley of Grindelwald, were gathered during several botanical excursions between March and May 1779, when Martin received the assistance of numerous local guides to cross the mountains before traveling down Italy towards Naples. 
Martin's display of these specimens shows that after the new museum and lecture rooms had been built, the herbarium played a far more prominent role in the workings of the garden, creating a unified repository of all botanical species represented in the Cambridge collection. So these new species were listed in a new catalogue of the Botanic Garden by John Salton, Horti, Horti Botanicae Cantabrigiensis Catalogus, published in 1794. Unlike Martin's Catalogus, Salton's catalogue, as you can see on the slide here, merely lists the Linnaean binomial, that being a two-part name for species represented in the garden, omitting the systematic descriptions, notes concerning the biogeographical distribution and common names. However, species that entered the garden um, and the collection after the production of the earlier catalogue, such as the Protea and Morus that I, I mentioned, um, are found in this particular list. You can see the Protea just here. However, Sultan died in 1794 and was replaced by the well-known gardener, James Don. Don had trained with William Aiton at Kew Gardens, was a protege of Joseph Banks, and published yet another catalogue of the Cambridge Botanic Garden, entitled Hortus Cantabrigiensis, or a catalogue of plants indigenous and foreign cultivated in the Walkerian Botanic Garden, Cambridge, a book re-edited until 1845. This book drew on Martin and Sultan's annotations and included a key to the various environmental conditions each plant needed to survive and information on its original geographical locality. Don continued to expand the collection and started to open the garden to more generally interested members of the university, local clergy and gentry. In comparison, Martin did not give any lectures after 1799, essentially retiring to his Bedfordshire village of Hall, although he did continue to produce significant works of natural history, such as his multi-volume Flora Rustica, and a new edition of Miller's Gardener's Dictionary. As a result, Sir James Edward Smith, who had purchased the Linnaean collections in 1784, the founder and first president of the Linnaean Society of London since 1788, formally applied for the Botanical Professorship in 1814. Prior to this, Smith had worked closely with Dunn as evidenced by Smith's extensive annotations in his copy of the 1804 edition of Hortus Cantabrigiensis, that, and these mostly cross-referenced species with illustrations in William Curtis's botanical magazine. A result of Smith's non-conformist religious views, the university refused to appoint him to the professorship, causing a pamphlet war with Henry Monk, the Regis Professor of Greek. In the first pamphlet, Smith described how the events that transpired to quote, involve the interests of science, of education, and of a great university, continuing to say that to quote, a large and highly important public body likely implicated by the ignorant or inconsiderate in the conduct of a few of its ill-advised members. This episode is really representative of the conservative backlash after the French Revolution. And as a result, there was no active botanical teaching until after Martin's death in 1825. Some botanical work was continued by James Dunn and his successor, Arthur Biggs, who maintained the garden and expanded the collection, taking deliveries of seeds from across Europe and the British Empire. New species entering the garden continue to be found in Martin's correspondence. In 1821, he wrote to Smith describing, to quote, a box of specimens of plants from Van Diemen's land, close quote. Smith received the specimens and the seeds were sent to Cambridge on the advice of Joseph Banks, who believed Kew already had examples of these species, really showing how Cambridge became a kind of clearinghouse for Kew gardens by the early 19th century. And it's currently uh, one of my main aims to actually find out who Martin's correspondent was in Van Diemen's land. So to finish off, Martin died in 1825 and was succeeded by John Stevens Henslow. A couple of years later, Henslow sent a pamphlet to all noteworthy botanists describing the poor state of the collection, commenting to quote, not half of the specimens were in sufficiently perfect state to be worth retaining and that the library was outdated and now seldom consulted. 
Henslow was determined to reform the Cambridge Botanic Garden, reorganize it according to new systems of classification and portray botany as a modern science to be incorporated into the emergent teaching of the natural sciences in Cambridge. This culminated in the removal of the garden to its current site in 1846. Henslow attempted to portray the old garden as old fashioned and underdeveloped. Rather, as I have hoped to show in this talk, 1760 marked the point when botanical practice was connected to the institutional framework of the university in Cambridge. This was integrated with a diverse global network that fed on British imperial expansion, revealing the numerous contributors and flows of specimens and information that built botany and later plant sciences in, as a major discipline in university teaching. And uh, thank you very much and uh, back over to Lauren. Thank you, Edwin. That was fantastic. Um, I always love hearing Edwin talk about this collection. Um, he, he can decipher the handwriting, he can make the connections between our collection and other collections um, far better than I, um, my limited knowledge of, th of these time periods and these plants and, and these people can do. It's, it's a really nice um, combination of the sciences and the arts together um, and connecting these collections. So what I'm going to do now is um, I'm going to show you some herbarium specimens uh, that I've got out um, already and I've also got some books um, from the library as well which I'm going to show you too. We originally, when we originally pitched this, we were hoping to have me and Edwin here together and then somebody filming us and we'd be having a conversation and looking at the specimens much more dynamically. Um, obviously that's a bit more difficult um, at the moment. We're not, still not even really allowed to be in the same room um, very easily. Um, so I've got a camera mounted up and I'm going to put some specimens underneath it. So I hope you'll be able to see them. Some of the ones are the ones which um, Edwin showed um, screenshots of already so um, hopefully you'll, you'll you'll see some of the connections and Edwin is going to uh, have a conversation with me about them and then we're going to um, have some some questions and answers so I'm just going to go through them um, I'm going to um, switch my camera over and check yep it's still working that's good <laughs> okay so um, I've got a selection of specimens out here um, first of all I'm going to show you one uh, which uh, Edwin did not pick I picked this one just because people always ask me about um, specimens and colour. Um, you know, when, you, when you make a herbarium specimen, um, can you preserve the colours in the specimen? Well, this is a specimen that was made in 1763. Um, it says Hort Cantab, uh, June 1763 on it, and it's a dra geranium. Um, so that's a pretty old specimen, and um, hopefully you can see, um, I could zoom, I, if I take the camera off and I put it really close, you can just see the petals. I mean, you can see that it's still got a lot of pink pigmentation on it. Let's see if I can put the camera back where it was. Brilliant. Um, so I just I just thought that was a, a nice one I came across as I was looking through the folders, getting some out for, for Edwin's talk. Um, but but yes, this specimen actually survived very well. Um, if you make your specimens, if you prepare your specimens carefully in the first place and you preserve them well, you keep them dry, keep them um, from being eaten by pests, then you can sometimes preserve the colours. Um, also, sometimes the chemicals in the colours, the pigments will break down, but it very much depends on what you've got. Here are some other specimens I pulled out. Um, these are um, all Asteraceae specimens collected um, in the Cambridge area. So uh, these uh, are all from Gamlingay. I've got a couple of them. Um, Edwin, I don't know if you wanted to say anything about um, yes, the collection the first, of the Cambridge. Yes, the first specimen we saw, that was actually grown by um, Thomas Martin and um, Charles Miller in the very earliest ages of the Cambridge Botanic, the very first year, in fact, that the Botanic Garden officially existed. The second specimen was, is really a product of the botanical teaching in Cambridge. You didn't have many formalised lectures, but what happened was the professors used to take small groups of students out on excursions across Cambridgeshire. And this is one of the specimens they collected and brought back from, I think, Gambling Gay Heath, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Here's another one from Gambling Gay as well. Um, there's a couple of really nice ones. Um, and there's another one. Um, but let's get to the ones which, which Edwin actually picked out to show you. That's another one. Um, so here's one of the ones um, from uh, William Houston. Um, and this is from Vera Cruz. This is a um, passiflora um, specimen. 
Yes, so this was almost um, certainly collected by the whoever they were, the indigenous man who William Houston prob probably employed actually and paid to go and collect specimens while Houston was marooned in Veracruz uh, port because he wasn't allowed to leave um, due to the, the Spanish authorities. Um, the um, Houston basically employed people to go into the provinces and collect botanical specimens for him. So this is this is a product of that collaboration, which was then communicated back to Martin Philip Miller and Hans Sloan. Great. Um, and then next up, we've got some of the Charles Miller specimens, which um, we think um, came from Sumatra. Um, these ones have little tiny labels on them. Um, I could again, I'll take the camera and I'll put it closer to this one. So maybe you can see that one. Um, I might have to focus it a little bit more. There you are. Um, you can see here, here we've got a label that says um, called by the natives. I think it's got a, a name, a local name. Um, and then it talks about um, a decoction being used um, medicinally and then it being grown uh, by Dr. Fothergill. Um, yes, so um, John Fothergill was another one of um, uh, Charles Miller's correspondents when he was in Sumatra. And again, he owned a private, a private botanic garden, which were relatively common in this time period with wealthy doctors and aristocrats. Fantastic. I should also say some of these, um, we don't actually know the names of the plants for sure. We've got some putative identifications on some of them. Sometimes the um, the specimen, there's a, a label on it, which we think is the original label, but sometimes we think the labels have been detached or moved around. And this is probably partly when um, John Stephen Henslow rescued this collection. He had to remount a lot of the material and put it onto new paper. So you've got a, a 300 year old specimen that might be mounted on 200 year old paper and then uh, the labels have been chopped and changed around may have been lost or put attached accidentally to the wrong one so there's um some detective work that's needed um, joining some of these up um, and then also just botanically figuring out what some of these things are from the material themselves as well yeah. so here's here's another of the charles miller specimens um this is a salicacy and this one the label says um it bears what is called by the natives the partridge berry uh, which is bright red and the size of an English grape, which is quite a nice little description there. And I, I find it extraordinary. It's very rare to see descriptions, systematic descriptions attached to specimens themselves which place such a heavy emphasis on the value of the knowledge in, in, basically given by the local people. Yeah, I think this is this is an area of the collection that um, hopefully we're going to, to do some more work on and um, and there's going to be an exhibition on, on sort of legacies of empire um, and colonial histories of some of our collections in Cambridge um, in, in a year or two's time. Um, and these are some of those specimens that we're particularly interested in looking at in that context. OK, so next we've got um, some of Thomas Martin's specimens from continental Europe. Um, here's one of your Grindelwald specimens. I don't know if you want to say anything about that. It's got the date 1779 and it says close to the glacier. Yes, he, I mean, he... The thing with these ones, they're quite interesting. You see specimens, you can basically trace his journey throughout Europe um, by looking at the specimens. And you, you forget, it looks like he just went to the edge of the glacier with, on his own or something and picked one specimen. No, he wasn't on his own. He was accompanied by dozens, probably half a dozen different people carrying bags, um, people looking after the horses, his student, often his wife, and his other members of his family. So it was really quite a, an expedition. Um, it was almost like, it wasn't quite like the grand tours that we envisaged from this period. It was that, you know, went to go and look at ruins in Italy. It was very much a sort of botanical grand tour. Excellent. As well, they should be. <laughs> this is a lovely one. I, re I really love this one. Um, this is an erythrodium, a little selection of them. Again, um, this is 1779, and these are collected from La Batte. Could you tell us? Yeah, so that's one? that's just near the Swiss border. He took an excursion from Geneva to visit that visit that town. He was, I think, he was marooned in Geneva for a couple of months due to the um, the weather in the Alps, and he couldn't he couldn't get across. I think we need a um, some sort of online exhibition or article about um, a botanical grand tour of, of Thomas Martin, maybe. 
Um, and then here we have some specimens which are from the, the old botanic garden, the, the um, Hortus cantabricus, which was in the centre of, of Cambridge. Um, here's a protea, a leucodendron yeah. specimen. Yeah, this is the, I think the one I, sh I showed in the, in the paper as well. Um, Martin's, uh, this was obviously grown in the new greenhouse, um, probably by Martin and James Dunn, I think. Um, and it, rep it represents where the specimens were coming from. I'm not entirely sure of how this particular specimen got to Cambridge. And that's something to find out. Um, but it's, it's still, it's very interesting to see how they actually grew it. And then another one, this is a uh, gera geranium again, um, 1764 on this one. And this is, this is another one which is preserved um, rather nicely. Um, it's, you won't be able to see on the camera, but there's still um, a lot of detail, a lot of hairs on this. Um, this one doesn't does not look that it like it was uh, pressed in 1764 for sure. Okay, and finally we've got a couple of specimens from the Banks and Solander material, so we believe this one um, has the label on it which says Pittosporum. We don't think this is Pittosporum, um, but it also does. It says B Bay, Botany Bay on it. Um, so I don't know if you want to say a little bit more about Banks and Solander. Yeah, Martin almost certainly accepted a series of duplicates that he used in university teaching from Joseph Banks and Daniel Solander. The main issue with this one is that the label denoting the actual place where it came from might probably isn't the label um, that was attached to the original specimen by Martin. I suspect this was mixed up by Henslow in the uh, 1820s. Yeah in the Great Salvage. Um, there are records um, in, the, in the taxonomic literature in botany um, saying that we re Cambridge received material from Banks and Solander, um, but uh, this is presumably the place where that material would be, but we don't actually know for sure. This one probably doesn't come out particularly well on the camera. It's <laughs> when I found this, <laughs> Edwin, it's a pretty tiny one, but this is a, a Senecio. A little tiny um, composite, but it's um, this is Joseph Banks' handwriting, isn't it? It is Joseph Banks' handwriting that, that um, basically um, corresponds with his the manuscript descriptions of plants that he took on the endeavour as it circumnavigated the globe. It's very typical of the specimens they collected in Tierra del Fuego, which is where this particular species came from. Uh, Banks himself describes them as uh, being rubbish. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Marvellous. How rude. Right. I'm going to put these specimens to one side um, and I'm just going to show some of the books quickly here. Um, this is um, a copy of um, Philip Miller's Gardener's Dictionary that he, we have here. You can just see the size. It was an extraordinary folio publication that went into many editions. It was incredibly popular <laughs> with lots, lots of people, not just in Cambridge, but you see, you see them in America and other places as well, by being used by American gardens. And what year was it published, this one? Oh, I, can't, oh. I can't quite see. <laughs> oh, I'm terrible. Oh, I should have. Uh, da, 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 da. There we are. 1730. Sorry. Uh, 1731, I think. Yeah, yeah I think I it, yes. Um, yes. That, Sorry, that, I, I that, put you on the spot be... and my, I'm terrible at deciphering. Um, <laughs> old dates too. Um, right, so here we've got, um, oh, which order should we do these in? Uh, we've got a catalogue of plants, we've got um, we'll, we'll Martin. catalogue first, I think. The catalogue. Uh, no, 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 that's done. The, Martin is the one with... Or this the, one. Yeah, the bar marble paper on the side. That one. Or oh, the marbled one. Sorry, sorry, big yeah. one. <laughs> right okay anyway, so this, here. Is book, this is the book i talked a fair amount about and this is a very special thing this is martin's own catalog uh, own copy of the catalogus that he presented to the botanic garden for the use of the curator as you can see inside the front cover here and he's interleaved it and annotated it um, according to the new species he added to the botanic garden and this is the one which has got that list at the beginning which is yeah. got the key um, and through, throughout, it's, it shows the new species coming into the garden as his network expanded. Um, I did put a couple of other bookmarks in some of them to show some other bits and bobs, but um, I think this one. So this is the same. Isn't this it? is the same, but this is Babington's yeah. copy with the portrait frontispiece of um, Walker, who founded the garden. Yeah. 
And then this one also has some nice annotations in it. Yeah. Um, here, this is an annotation about um, Belladonna, Atropa Belladonna. I don't know if that's going to show very well. I'm being careful because I don't want to split the spines or damage them at all. But that note um, down here at the bottom, and is that is that John Martin's handwriting? No, this this was actually purchased later. I think it came from Elmer Bork Lambert. Okay. Another so this very famous some... botanist. It was purchased in the 19th century by the university. Got you. So this one says it's um, supposed to operate by infusion as a beauty wash by the Italian ladies. So you know the stories of Atropa Belladonna um, dilating the pupils. Um, it's nice to have a, that there. And here we've also got um, beautiful little annotations um, within the margins. And, and quite a few of these older books have these kinds of um, diagrams yes, and annotations there we've got. Just, just, just meant to be read. They were meant to be practical tools to be engaged with, i.e. as they made the garden. And here we have... We've, oh, no. we've just done that one. <laughs> Sorry, it's a little one. I put them back in the wrong order. Sorry, this one. Here we've got um, the um, Don's catalogue. Yeah, and that, that made many, many editions. And it made John quite famous. And the nice thing about it is that it's Henslow's copy. Yes. So there you can see um, J.S. Henslow, 1800. And then you've got his book plate, Henslow's book plate inside. Um, and yeah, and lists. And listed the plants with the various attributions. OK, so I'm going to stop um, sharing that camera. Um, gosh, we've got lots of questions. And um, apologies, that took a little bit longer than hoped um but um shall we go through some of the questions um those of you who who have to go with we apologize um but maybe we could stay on a little bit longer is that okay yes i'd be happy great thank you thank you so much lauren and edwin that was fantastic really really interesting and i just think uh, you know one of our participants christina commented about that she's really looking forward to the stories that are coming out which is yeah i think it's sort of the key to it isn't it it's all the different things the stories behind every specimen so we've got yeah some really lovely things from people um i'll start with richard um he wrote for a wonderful presentation and he says the challenging material from sumatra it looks really interesting and whether he returned any seeds that were successfully cultivated in cambridge and also if there's any evidence of how Thomas Martin treated or valued or not the kinds of um, Indigenous knowledge that Miller or other correspondents um, um, communicated. Shall I go for that one? Yeah, I don't know the answer, <laughs> so please do. Yes. Um, so um, to begin with, seeds that came from Sumatra, the answer is right now I'm not entirely sure. Um, I have not found any references and I suspect they might have been particularly difficult to grow because the stove house might, it would have basically, it would have kept things at about 10 to 20 degrees in the winter, which still isn't hot enough for tropical plants used to 25 plus. So it might have been very difficult to grow, I think, um, some of these some of these seeds, but certainly the, Martin, I mean, I mean, the good evidence for Martin's, how he valued indigenous names is through the fact that he didn't throw away the labels, then they are still here. Um, Martin endlessly collected local names on his tour through, um, through, through um, Europe. And I think he recognised the importance um, of taking down the local names really um, throughout his career. His, his father used to take down local names as well. Hans Sloan, who he knew as a child and visited Hans Sloan's collection as a child, um, used to place a fair amount of emphasis on the importance of local names. Um, and I think Martin, like many banks did this as well, saw the local term as a major route for developing a Latin binomial. Often the first part of the binomial was based on the genus and that couldn't be changed. But the second part was very, is very often arbitrary. Um, and Often in this period, botanists used to select uh, a name that related somehow to either its physical appearance or how a plant was used. And that's why Martin um, continued to value the indigenous names, because they normally had an essential root in them as to how a plant was actually used. 
That's really interesting. And that, that kind of um, connects quite nicely with a lot of discussions that are going on now in, in botany, um, in natural history, about how we name um, new species, or new, newly discovered and published to Western science and how we name things. Um, we have an awful lot of specimens and uh, plants which are named after a uh, certain demographic of people who may have discovered them, but they were actually used extensively for a very long period of time and known by communities in other places. Um, so that's, that's quite a nice tie in there. That's really interesting. Excellent. Um, we've got Yvette with us today as well. She's um, curating one of John Martin's collections at the RHS's herbarium. She, she puts in brackets two specimens on one sheet. So she um, says the lavender specimens were most certainly made by Miller in the Chelsea Physics Garden in 1731. But ask, you know, among your finds, have you seen any paperwork um, pertinent to the transfer of specimens from Chelsea at around this time? Um, Yvette's eager to discover more about the specimens, and especially if this task, sorry, taxon is not replicated in the, the Miller CPG collections at the Natural History Museum. I, I'll add on something on the provenance of the Chelsea Physic Garden and Miller, certainly. I, I mean, Lauren might want to talk a bit about the second, second part. Um, there are hundreds of specimens exchanged between Miller and Martin grown in the Chelsea Physic Garden in the collection is something I didn't really go into, um, mainly because I tried to concentrate on the later period. Um, basically, Martin, John Martin lived opposite Miller in Chelsea, and they were good friends, which is how uh, Thomas Martin and Charles Miller also knew each other. They grew up with one another. Um, and there was a massive exchange of material between Miller and John Martin pretty much for the entirety of both of their careers. And there are lots and lots of specimens grown in Chelsea that are products of seeds sent by people like William Houston that have then been annotated by Miller and John Martin in the Cambridge collection. That's great. That's great. And and um, and this happens today as well. Herbaria exchange material. We exchange specimens uh, between different collections. Generally, specimens are made in duplicate sets. So one single plant collected at one single time. Um, one single place, um, you make multiple specimens from that one collection um, and you distribute them to different collections and and you see that in these historic specimens as well as modern day specimens. What's, what's um, tricky with historic specimens often is that they didn't necessarily put all the information on the label with specimen on the sheet itself. Nowadays, we tend to try to make sure that that, that information, or the key information at least, is on the specimen. Um, so it's through work of, of researchers like Edwin who can access the, the literature, the, the archives, the, the notebooks and diaries and travel plans of, of, of all these individuals, they can actually figure out which is which. So when, as a botanist, if I look at a specimen, as a curator, if I look at a specimen and there's a very skimpy little note on it, sometimes not even that, it's not terribly useful for me, but actually having historians looking at the material and connecting them up and accessing the archives and the library materials, that's actually how we can, we can retrieve that information and connect it up. It's hugely valuable. Fantastic. Sort of following on from that with collaboration, Christina asks whether there was any I guess, collaboration with the, the garden at Kew and you mentioned that Don trained under Aiton. Did they continue to correspond and share specimens and information that you know of? Yes, I think um, Cambridge basically um, in the, the earlier part of the 19th century, uh, most of the specimens that Cambridge received were batches of new material that came into Kew. Plants were then cultivated in Kew and grown as seedlings and then sent up to Cambridge for Don to, Don to continue to grow. Um, you, can really see, you can really see that sort of network coming through. What you do see just before Henslow comes in is a distinct shift, um, especially after Martin's partial retirement, in where the material is coming from. Because normally it would have, in the earlier period, it came directly, usually from somebody out in, say, Sumatra or the West Indies to Martin, who managed the correspondence network, and then to the curator, and then it was cultivated in the garden. When Martin retired, it often came to Banks or William Ayton who then corresponded with Don, and then it ended up in the garden. So it's a slightly different um, sort of hierarchy, hierarchical structure that you see at the end of the, the end of the time. 
That's really interesting. And there, I mean, we've skimmed the surface. This is this is only a few of the connections. Um, one of the collections we haven't mentioned is Oxford's collections. We have lots of specimens which we find in, in the Martin collection, um, which mention Delenius and Sherard um, and the Sherardian uh, garden. Um, really strong links with Oxford as well. Um, Sibthorpe as well for later period. There's several collected on yeah. the Sibthorpe's um, uh, continental tour. Yeah, so joining these collections up is is, is a really, really interesting and, and literally connecting all those dots um, is, is going to be fascinating. Um, I was also going to say um, this relationship with, with institutions like Kew in particular continued. Um, and in the 19th century and into the 20th century, the connection between Kew, um, Kew's herbarium and garden and Cambridge um, was still very strong and there was some fantastic work done by Caroline Cornish, Felix Driver and Mark Nesbitt, um, Royal Holloway and Q um, in the last few years um, called the Mobile Museum um, Project, it was AHRC funded um, and they found so many connections and um, I think Cambridge came out really high up in the list of um, recipients and um, those exchanging material material coming into Q and then being sent out to other collections, including the Cambridge collection particularly. So really interesting stuff. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Quite a few questions to get through, but um try to get through a couple of extras um, that are specifically for Lauren. So Joe asks um, about the recolorizing of old photos or using AI and whether there's any other way to to run through the specimens to sort of find out what the, the color was i guess <laughs> i've just scrolled oh, back and I, I can see the comment a little bit mulch colored yeah <laughs> if you're not a herbarium aficionado um <laughs> yeah some sometimes some older specimens in particular can look a little bit sludgy um you gotta love them um nonetheless and when you come across the ones which are brightly colored still then it's quite re rewarding um I don't know if people have done that. I'm sure some artists have done some of that kind of work. Um, and and um, I can imagine you get some really beautiful results from that. From a scientific perspective, it's not something we really necessarily do. Um, also, you can make you can make specimens nowadays, um, really beautifully made specimens, and the pigments don't stay and they do break down. So I can make a sludgy coloured specimen last week um, that would look like it was 300 years old as well and vice versa so um yeah <laughs> I guess sort of following on to that you showed a few specimens that you weren't sure that that, that were accurately named mm -hmm. Lane asks about whether there's any plans to extract DNA from any of the the specimens the very old specimens in order to get a yeah ID that's a brilliant question um increasingly that kind of technology is looking more possible um with some of these specimens um so uh, DNA techniques, molecular techniques, extracting DNA from herbarium specimens is actually getting easier with the newer techniques which are available now. Um, it's really rapidly area, expanding area of, of research, people doing that in collections. Um, and so hopefully it will be possible to do a bit more of that in the future. We haven't really done very much of it with, with um, the Cambridge herbarium. Um, there has been a little bit done in with some of the 19th century material we've ha we have. And, um, but I don't think anything's been done on material this old yet um, because your chances of it working at the moment still are reduced because the DNA will be much more fragmented and, and, and could be um, degraded and, and even methylated and modified. So it becomes more difficult. Also, taking DNA out of something is destructive. So you literally have to take a piece off the specimen. You have to mash it up in a tube um, with your chemical reagents and, and do something with it. You can't get it back, it's gone. Um, so making those decisions about what we destructively sample has to be taken on a, a very careful uh, case by case basis. Um, if you have one single flower on a specimen and your technique will need a flower uh, to, to, to get a result, then it's unlikely you're going, it, it wouldn't be ethical to use that. Um, we'd have to come up with some other, other approaches. Um, but yeah, things like that are increasingly possible. We just haven't done any of it ourselves with this material. I'm going to sneak in a question from Stefan for you, Lauren. It's about orchids. Do you know if there's a species of orchid from Borneo? 
or how do I find out more? Oh, I think I saw that one in the chat. Yeah, I, was, I wasn't sure. Person. Yes. Um, yeah, Liparis. I wasn't sure if that was relating to the Martin material. Um, I don't know if we've got any Liparis specimens um, in the Martin collection. I don't think so. I don't think I've spotted that. Um, but there are lots and lots of resources online. I would direct people to resources like the World Checklist of um, vascular plants and and plants of the world online if you pop those into google you'll you'll find them quite quickly those are q based resources um uh, other resources are available um the world flora online there's lots of resources online where you can find out about um different plants and plant names and where they come from so sorry that's a very brief answer but that's that's a whole field of of um, for a whole lecture <laughs> Wonderful. And we've got a last question for Edwin. Um, Nicole asks about the botanical garden in Padua, Italy. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Was that Padua? Padua, Padua yes. Yeah. How was it arranged at that time? If you know. Yeah, in many continental European, well, usually they were rearranged according to the Linnaean system much later than the foundation of the Cambridge Garden, usually 20 or 30 years after. Um, at this time, at the time of the foundation of the Cambridge Garden in 1760, many European botanic gardens were arranged according to the medical, the practices used by the physicians in the medical schools. And the main taxonomic system that they would have used was the one developed by Joseph Piton de Tournefort, French naturalist in around 1700. And that was mainly based on the more general morphological uh, characters of plants. Uh, the Linnaean system put a very specific emphasis on the um, physical parts of the flowers, whereas Tournefort took into account things like the shape of the roots, the stalk, the leaves, etc. Absolutely. Fantastic. Um, we probably should wrap up there because we have got on 15 minutes. Well, thank you very much for coming and, and staying on the line for, for so long. And um, if you have any specific questions about Martin, uh, do feel free to email me. My email was on the, uh, the slides, but it's edr24 then at cam.ac.uk um, and I'll be happy I'd be happy to answer any any more questions people might have. Thank you ever so much for joining us today. For people who want to find out more about the herbarium we have a Twitter um, handle CU Herb um, please do follow us if you're on Twitter. Uh, we now have a YouTube channel so we're starting to put our videos and things up there and I'm also collating playlists from other collections um, friends other, and, and other research um, which is herbarium based around the world. Um, also our tour that we had on Friday um, is now up on YouTube on our YouTube channel and we also have got some online transcription events. We are just starting to digitize our collections, get our collections available um, online um, for the first time to build a database and to make our collections much more accessible. We hope to show you lots more of this collection in the future.